It's Shinobi, and we are bringing you Block Digest episode 257 at block height 671,614 on Sunday, February 21st. And this is going to be a fun one. Um, so Janine is gone um, for the next week or two because she has to deal with some stuff. But guess who's back? Uh-oh. Yeah, finally. 257. Holy jeez. I missed quite a few episodes. How you been? Doing all right, man. Doing all right. Glad we finally pulled you back in. And then a new member um, joining for the foreseeable future. We've drafted our buddy, BTC FUD. What's going on, FUD? Feeling cute. Might do Black Digest later. I don't know. Right on. Sounds like we got ourselves a good set for a good conversation in here. And, uh... Yeah, it looks like the news is just keep racking up. I mean, the price is up there, but the news is up there. There's a lot to talk about. And last announcement, J.W. Weatherman is joining. I'm sorry. Yeah, that's total bullshit. <laughs> 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 that never I'm sorry, but it's the worst part of the clubhouse. They let J.W. on there, and they let him up to talk about authoritatively about things, I think. I guess you get to make up your own mind, so that part's good. The clown is oh, on yeah. the stage with the experts. The clubhouse. I'm sure there's nobody in there with a tape recorder hiding under a monkey suit or anything. Oh no! no. It takes like a quarter of NBK's day now just to keep up with JW Fud. Yep. And the world keeps turning. But yeah, it's been uh, it's been a while. It's good to be back, and it's good to have user in here talking with us too. And um, yeah, hopefully uh, Janine's traveling safe. But yeah, there's a lot of stuff to talk about. You want to take us into this stuff, Shino? Well, I think before we slide into that stuff, um, one trillion dollars, one trillion dollars, one trillion dollars. It's okay to get excited now, people. That is a big number. Yeah. Did we, uh, are we still under alphabet or over alphabet now? Like, there's only like a few companies ahead of us. We're one trillion. Good God. <laughs> yeah, it's a handful. It's like, what was it? The 10th largest asset in the world? Maybe 11th? We're up there now. Yeah, it's hard not to take Bitcoin seriously whenever you're just up there at a trillion. I mean, one trillion. Good Lord. I remember just like, oh, we're a hundred billion now. And like, can you imagine when it's a trillion? We're here. We're here. We're up here in the atmosphere, man. The price. I just don't even want to talk about it. But the the market cap. Yeah, one trillion. Good God. Congratulations, Bitcoin. I, I just like seeing that extra digit just Bitcoin. We don't we don't have to count the shit coins this time. Just Bitcoin. Right. Shit coins are out. Oh yeah, not this round. Shitcoin season. Go away. But yeah, let's pop the corks. One trillion. Let's keep going to two trillion on the ten trillion and a hundred million trillions that people have they're gonna make a number up for eventually. Alrighty, FUD. Are you ready, sir, for your debut? Covering a story on Block Digest. Yeah, let's uh, let's see if I can do this. Now, this is not the simplest thing. I may try to break this down a little bit if provoked, but I am not a professional. This is not financial advice, and I'll probably get it wrong, but I'll do my best here. So, good old micro strategy. Where have I heard of them before? I don't know, Tornets or Chad lasers or something. Laser eyes. Oh, yeah. I, I do like the laser chat hornets. Uh, so these guys, they've figured out, here's the thing. I've said this from the beginning. It's very expensive to fund an army of laser chat hornets. So eventually you end up raising money to do that. 
And in this case, it looks like this week they raised $1.05 billion in what is referred to as a convertible note offering. Uh, it's not completely clear to me whether that's all the same thing or whether 900 mil of that is one thing, another 150 of that is another thing, uh, but it's a whole lot of money. I think we can all agree a billion dollars, still a big number, even though they print that like every Tuesday or whatever, right? But it's a big number. Um, so points of focus here, let's see, they get to sell that debt for 0%. Uh, interest. So if I had a million dollars, I could give them a million dollars. They will give me back no gains on that in terms of debt. Oh, that's interesting. What is this thing then? This is a chance for somebody later to either get paid back on this debt at zero because they want the right to participate or under certain terms and conditions, convert this into micro strategy class A common stock later on. Should I jump into the details here? The details are murky, but on MicroStrategy's press page, you can read them yourself and keep up with me. So uh, it looks like there are certain terms and conditions around this, that if MicroStrategy is winning so hard by February 20th, 2024, they can offer to pay off these notes in cash before the people who buy them could ever redeem them for stock. The people are buying these because they think they're gonna get a better deal on the stock in the future than they would get um, buying it straight right now or perhaps buying Bitcoin straight right now. I don't know what they're betting on, but they definitely want exposure. But I thought it was interesting uh, just that MicroStrategy has a clause in there where it looks like for almost two years until sometime in 2026, if their stock is doing well enough, which is defined in here, it's gotta be at least 130% of the conversion price then they can start using money to buy these things back. They don't have to let people get their shares. They don't end up diluted. And congratulations for playing. You own MicroStrategy. Money is 0% interest. You win. All right, so how should we wrap this up? Um, big deal, billion bucks. Evidently a billion bucks doesn't need yield to get exposed to Bitcoin these days. Wow. Yeah. That is just kind of, that seems to me like um, suckers are being taken advantage of to leverage up on the corn. Um, yeah. Yeah, it sounds so, like MicroStrategy is trying to maybe just grab some, some more Bitcoin. I don't know. Yeah, 1000 bucks off the table, boys. Very good job now, sadly. Only one one thousandth of the Bitcoin supply now. But I mean, hmm. like, think about it, though. Like, if, if you're not, you're earning yield on that. And your expectation is you can convert that to micro strategy stock later, but they have a back out clause where they can just go, nope, here's your cash. Thanks for playing. Um, yeah. He's just giga Chad fucking picking the pockets of suckers to build up their Bitcoin stack higher. I think the meme goes, look at me. I'm the central banker now. <laughs> yeah. My God. I've been a little taken back by uh, Michael Saylor and MicroStrategy. And I mean, because, you know, this all happened while I've been gone. And uh, for sure, just to see him and uh, the way like you were just describing, kind of get these this army of laser Chad Hornets moving. This is uh, it's pretty surreal to see. And it really does make me wonder, like, uh, you know, because we talked a lot before about Bitcoin ETFs and how much Bitcoin there is and like, you know, controlling, you know, what's the it's, what's the where is this going? And like, uh, it does seem like it's a smart strategy for a company with a lot of cash, but um, it is a large, it's starting to get on a larger supply of Bitcoin, but I guess whatever, he's just stacking sats, he's going to make other companies stack sats. I mean, wow. I, I'm just kind of blown away. Yeah, a billion and all this stuff is just going to be uh, probably turned into some more Bitcoin. I mean, the price is going up. Jesus. Tesla. I mean, we bought 1.5 billion in Bitcoin. Michael right. Saylor. Is it Thursday? Oh yeah, let's buy a billion bucks of Bitcoin, boys. Well, what is this? This isn't an it, it's not a token, it's a stock, right? So this is a bond issuing, uh, which is debt that his company will now bear. Uh, only it's a special kind of debt that in certain cases can get paid off as with right. cash. And in certain cases, it'll turn into micro strategy stock. Now, I didn't focus on that point. If it ends up not getting paid off in the interim, 
like let's say Sailor didn't want to use any of his free cash flow to pay down the debt. He just wanted to keep issuing it. The alternative is if it turns into shares in 2027, so this is an interest-free loan for approximately six years, if it turns into shares in 2027, they're going to be worth 50% more than they were the day they were issued. So he'll give you enough shares that equal 150% of your input cost. So if your money does turn into shares, you just got a 50% bonus on what that would have bought you at the day that they issued. So it's, it's nice for you from that perspective. And if you think, uh, as you know, some do, that Michael is leveraging an S&P company into a leveraged Bitcoin hedge fund of some sort, uh, you know, maybe that's something you want to bet on. Well, I mean, the kicker here to me just is like the specific details of those different terms. Like, you know what I mean? It like, how, how is this going to get played in the long term? Is this actually like going to just let this convert into stock for those who want it and don't play games or, oh, here's some cash. Thanks for the free money in the pile of Bitcoin. Man, if you're Mike and you're winning all day long and you got this big pile of cash and it's going to keep your other shareholders from getting diluted, well, those people signed the term sheet, entered into it, you know, took the risk and you can pay them out early. Oh, man, I can't see why you wouldn't want to do that. Yep. Hyper Bitcoinization much, man. This is crazy. <laughs> got to get that stack, man. Yep. I mean, wow. you know, it's no secret. I am not fond of Michael Saylor and his general attitude about this space, but it's happening. <laughs> the speculative attack is actually fucking happening <laughs> with 0% yeah. interest. <laughs> Good God. Yeah, somebody call somebody at the Fed. Like, the bad guys aren't supposed to get to use 0% interest. <laughs> Man, it's really curious where we go from here, just thinking about everything and like yeah you were saying with tesla like i mean you saw you guys saw his uh you know the news he he flipped his he was laser eyed for a day and now he's like a uh, he's a fork in the road i wonder where that fork is going yep so i guess any more thoughts on this or uh rick you want to take us into some funny stuff oh i've got a lot more thoughts on this but i'd like to take us into some funny stuff and we'll flush them out all right guys so it looks like it is happening. Like the delisting of BSV, it's been going on, but now it's BCH and it's from OKCoin. And so that's a, let's see what's going on. Let's talk. Our, there's a blog post it's from the CEO of OKCoin, Hong Fang. And uh, it's a good blog post on the situation. We'll have it linked in the show notes. But uh, here are some highlights from what she says. Quote, we announced that trading of BSV and BCH among several other crypto assets, will be suspended on OKCoin starting on March 1st, 2021. Today's announcement was the result of our most recent asset review. However, in the spirit of transparency, there is some unique history and context specific to our decision to remove BSV and BCH, which we'd like to share with the community. The very creation of OKCoin in 2013 was inspired by Satoshi Nakamoto's Bitcoin white paper and the ensuing emergence of a crypto industry. We chose to be a neutral platform when it comes to trading the native assets of these blockchains, BTC, BSV, and BCH have always been available on our platform. Our customers can choose for themselves where to put their money. Today, BTC's market cap, market cap has grown to almost $1 trillion. We just talked about it. It's over a trillion now. Overtaking top public companies like Visa and Facebook in size, BCH and BSV, in contrast, are valued at, retrospect at respectively 1.5% and 0.5% of the original Bitcoin. At this point, it seems that the markets have cast their vote on what Bitcoin was built for. In spite of BTC's market dominance, we wouldn't have changed our neutral practice with BSV and BCH if it were not for what happened on January 21st, 2021, when the news hit that Craig Wright, the infamous self-proclaimed creator of Bitcoin and BSV supporter, was taking actions to enforce copyright claims on the Bitcoin white paper. We found ourselves facing a very uncomfortable dilemma. We feel very disturbed by the copyright claim and threat of legal actions that Craig Wright is waging against the open source community. Wright's recent lawsuit against websites hosting the Bitcoin white paper are part of a long historical chain of problematic legal actions surrounding his entire unproven claim to be the creator of the original cryptocurrency. Bitcoin has never been owned or controlled by an individual, any individual or entity, nor should it ever be. 
Bitcoin was created by the pseudo-anonymous Satoshi Nakamoto. Regardless of who Nakamoto is are, the ethos of open source, decentralized, and community-driven consensus building runs deep in Bitcoin's DNA. To challenge that ethos is to, cha is to challenge the very foundation of what Bitcoin stands for. 2020 was the year when we welcomed a new wave of investors into crypto. Most of them are embracing crypto because of their interest in Bitcoin. Such branding ambiguity for Bitcoin can be very misleading to new retail investors. As we at OKCoin continue to build a global gateway to crypto, we have to ask ourselves, how can we play a responsible role in promoting awareness and protecting new entrants from unintentional trades? To be clear, we are not against hard forks in general, and we see the value in some of these networks and what they're creating. We are also not against the communities that believe in the utility of these tokens. We fully respect that. People should be able to agree to disagree. We are just having a hard time ignoring the malicious mis misinformation war waged by Craig Wright and other high-profile members of these communities, nor can we gracefully give investors access to BSV or BCH while realizing that some may feel tricked or confused by the branding ambiguity between these assets and Bitcoin. Close quote. Now, like the blog post described and you guys explained in episode 253, the terrorist is coming. A little play on Craig Wright's typo. Fake Toshi is suing anyone who uploads the Bitcoin white paper. And this drunkard's ability to scare our community is sad and really shouldn't be tolerated. I mean, this action is a good move by uh, one of the biggest exchanges close to the market that's buying Fake Toshi's bullshit, that mainly being from non-English speaking countries around Asia and Southeast Asia. This comes on the heels, a consortium of companies actually building COPA, the Cryptocurrency Open Patent Alliance, being led by Square and other big companies in the space, you know, uh, really strange bedfellows here like Blockstream and Coinbase and Satoshi Labs, just to name a few. But uh, COPA has uploaded the Bitcoin white paper to their domain and also gotten a lawsuit from Craig Wright. Now COPA has in turn responded, demanding Wright validate his claims to the white paper and Bitcoin by answering a series of questions. Now I've got this pulled up here. It's kind of where my notes teetered off, but let me pull up these questions. We can kind of see. All right. So question number one, please explain on what basis you assert that your client is the individual behind the pseudo pseudonym Satoshi Nakamoto and is the author of the white paper. On what date or dates does your client say that he wrote the white paper? At what location or locations does your client say that he wrote it? Please provide the above information for the version released on October 31st, 2008, and all drafts further referenced in these questions to the white paper, including all versions and drafts. Is it your client's position he wrote the white paper alone or with others? If the latter, please identify the co-authors and when such contributions were made. If your client's position is that another person or persons edited or otherwise contributed to the white paper, but do not such as to amount to co-authorship, please identify such person or persons and when such contributions were made. On what basis provided for by any applicable international convention does your client claim to be entitled to UK and other copyrights in the white paper? Was your client employed by, did he hold any office with, or did he work under contract to any person's organization or business at any time during the periods of periods identified in questions one through four? If so, please set out the nature and status of any such roles. Is it your client's position that the work that he says he did on the white paper fell outside of any such employments, offices, or contractual relationships? And the last question is it your client's position that he has at all times since authoring the white paper owned the copyright therein? If at any time he has assigned or otherwise divested himself of said copyright or agreed to do so, please provide information about any such transaction and the basis on which he now claims to own copyright in the white paper. And so, yeah, I mean, uh, we can really kind of just uh, sit back and kind of laugh as a uh, fake Toshi really just making a complete ass of himself. And, uh, getting delisted at some of the most important places that his market needs. Yeah. I'm, I'm loving that, that legal breakdown. It's absolutely great when the lawyers get a step up and start clarifying things because you make claims and uh, you know, somebody is going to find where your claims may run short pretty quick. But I don't think too many of us can say that this, this is not a problem that, 
Mr. Fake Toshi created for himself. Dude, that's the best part of it. Like early on, you started seeing like D listings or refusal to lists based more on like ideological attitudes. You know what I mean? And then it started dominoing to like the point where exchanges were delisting crap like this because you are literally causing problems for the exchange. Like, why are you forking off Bcash again? Like, blah, blah, blah. And then that happened. And now it's literally getting to the point where exchanges are delisting this shit because it's just like, dude, <clears throat> you are a blatant, manipulative, lying scammer. Stop. <laughs> like it just openly. Well, it's in an important time, right? Like you like they said in the post, I mean, 2020 has been a huge year. And like we're saying, there's a lot of new investors stepping up and, you know, we're seeing some assets go to crazy levels like we know they would. But I mean, uh, you know, at least uh, when somebody's buying said asset of like Doge, they don't think they're buying like, you know, it's Doge cash or something like that. Yeah. I'm just glad that CSW can step up and remind us that we got to burn our heroes at the stake. <laughs> yes, please. Like, uh, this guy is burning. And um, I don't think anybody needs to throw him a cup of water. Just let him burn. All right. So that's all I got on this guy. Uh, where were we going from here? Let's Something see. It looks like cool. Chino. Oh, yeah. I was looking into this real quick. I was, oh, man. Yeah, there's like some updates coming out. Uh, yeah. It's really good to be back just to keep up with these updates. New BIP proposal. So I think like the last two episodes, in one way or another, we've discussed the recent um, multi-sig issue with the cold card and Schiff's involvement in um, all of how that was portrayed and shit. But it, this still leaves a, an outlying problem here. <clears throat> all these devices that could possibly wind up participating in a multi-sig need to have standard ways everybody can support to verify the setup of the multi-sig was done properly. So um, Hugo at uh, Nunchuck, a PSBT multi-sig wallet, um, Peter and Rodolfo from CoinKite, um, Marco from Shift Crypto, and Aaron Chen, um, I have proposed a BIP for a multi-sig setup standard. And pretty much um, the idea here is to start using um, output descriptors as well as creating this abstract concept of a coordinator and kind of just upping the security level here to the point where setting up a multi-sig would revolve around this coordinator. <clears throat> and abstractly, that could be a software wallet. Um, I could even see this being this coordinator function being built into the hardware wallet itself um, if there was resources and space for that. But pretty much um, <clears throat> this coordinator would put itself in the middle of all the signer devices here and generate a token to make an encryption key from. <clears throat> and then from that point, you would pass that out to all the signing devices um, and then have them spit out output descriptors, um, their XPubs, so on, <clears throat> and then encrypt this to the token and pass to the coordinator who puts things together in terms of actually constructing the multi-sig addresses, um, verifying all of that, and then passing it back to the signing device um, with a checksum. And at this point, each device would go through and verify that its XPUB is part of the, the multi-sig that just got set up and display to the user all of the XPUBs, the descriptor, and the checksum that was tagged on all of that so that the setup would effectively guarantee more shielded communications between devices, i.e. only the coordinator in between all of this can actually even see the information being passed around. And then the checksum for all the XPUBs and descriptor and such 
could be manually verified on the device after the device verifies that its key is in fact part of this descriptor setup. And then at this point, ideally you would have the device save that, store that securely, and it can toss the coordinator token away and have a lot stronger guarantees, both in terms of reducing the um, points at which you can try man in the middle attacks, but also putting front and center in, in the user's face that checksum to verify all of the XPUBs on each device, assuming the device is verifying that its keys are part of the multisig. And so the, the whole kind of proposal is like, let's let's stop the drama and the fucking around and the sniping, and let's actually think through how do we do this securely in a standard so that all the things out there can do that. And we don't have this swampland of weird fringe attack vectors and issues with multi-sig because you used these three things and they can't talk to each other in this way or don't verify this and so on because yeah we are in the wave of everybody use multi-sig that shit needs to get done right it needs to get standardized and we need to be able to move on securely instead of just drama every other week so i definitely concur standards of power and I, I don't know that you can take a practice like multi-sig too seriously until there are standards which can encompass most of the popular software hardware. Um, for the procedures to generate something like a multi-sig, use a multi-sig, just interact within, including starting that. Uh, this sounds fantastic, whatever layer you're coding at. Uh, whether you're making wallets run on computers or phones or whether you make a cold card, you would love to have that standard because then it's very easy to do this now that we have a standard because we're just going to do exactly what the standard says and you'll get the output that the standard says. And I don't know, I think it's kind of cool. Like imagine you and your friend showed up with some cold cards, roll a die to see who gets to be the official, uh, you know, central party in this generation and you just go. You make a multi-sig because uh, everybody's little calculator supports it. Oh, but one guy wanted to use Electrum. Okay, he can use that. Oh, somebody else really likes whatever. Great. I, this is great. Absolutely. Yeah. Put, bring, bring in different, you know, wallets together, and especially, you know, yeah, the hardware wallets is always just a big back and forth. So to have something, some standard where everybody could come together on multi-sig, because multi-sig is so huge. And, I mean, everybody's rethinking their setups and you got to start rethinking. Yeah. And you need to be thinking partially side Bitcoin transactions and multi-sig and having your setups proper. And uh, so it's good to have a standard. Yeah. It'd be awesome. Well, I mean, it's just like, so like, so fucking necessary. And like, we've seen these problems happen with other areas of the space so many times, like different seed formats and incompatibilities, like not using, um, the defined BIP dictionary for that, um, derivation paths. It, it, it always just winds up leaving the user insecure or the user with a giant fucking headache when they want to try and move from one thing to another. And it's like, it, it always turns into, well, my idea is better or you fucked something up. And it's just, everybody just forgets about the fucking user because there's no standard. There's no do it this way because this is what's easiest for the user. This is what's safest for the user and just move on from the fucking bickering. You need those standards to stop that kind of dynamic. It'd be really good to have that with Taproot too. Because I mean, like Taproot's all about multi-sig, right? Well, I mean, honestly, I don't think... In, I mean, in implementation, you're definitely going to have to update things to work with Taproot. But honestly, um, I don't really see what would need to change much here except just extra rounds of passing data around and like verifying checksums on stuff. You know what I mean? Right. Just sort of like increasing the numbers. Gorgeous. But yeah, this is awesome. Yeah, so I saw that whole head spin about, you know, the mul the hardware wallets again. And, you know, it's always something. But uh, now I can understand like, yeah, it's, you know, usually there's something that comes good from these discussions and that's a little heated well, hopefully it'll be a standard on these things. Mm -hmm. So are we ready for another BIP proposal? 
Oh, the bips just keep coming. What's the next bip? Well, it is a proposal from Justice uh, Ranveer, the creator of BIP47, to update um, BIP47. And, yeah, um, this is one of those things where I can understand the, um, the reasons for wanting to change some things, but then look at how they are changed and go, you kind of just maybe addressed one issue and exacerbated other issues. Um, <clears throat> but pretty much the, the high level gist of bit 47 is you have your payment codes and by combining, say, your public key and my corresponding private key, I can give you something that would allow you to flip around and take your private key and my public key and generate the, the private key to spend the new address I just made. And you use op return to kind of encrypt and put that in an op return output um, on chain to guarantee that it's not really um, to, pretty much to guarantee that when you go scanning the blockchain, you will find all of the money people have sent to you this way and not miss some because you didn't know and don't have their public key information, et cetera. And it's kind of dependent on that notification um, transaction. So <clears throat> the two main things that this proposal um, would change is one, add support for more than one coin with separate derivation paths. Um, because right now, if you kind of tried to take the same payment code and use that on Bitcoin and on Litecoin, like addresses are going to get reused and that would kind of blow, um, you know, a lot of the privacy dynamic going on here to some degree. Um, but Pretty much, they want to change the structure of that notification transaction, um, and instead of use op return, which severely limits how many notifications you can send at once, um, uses a weird one of three bare multisig setup. So, pretty much, instead of shoving things in the op return output, what you're going to do is take one key in this one of three multi-sig that's your actual key to be able to spend your change from this at some point later and then the other two outputs or public keys in this one of three multi-sig are kind of um where you're hiding or nesting the information in the transaction so that the receiver can generate the appropriate keys to spend the money you send them and this would allow you potentially to bundle multiple notifications in a single transaction because of the lack of op return restrictions. But the thing here is um, that's a raw multi-sig. So pay to script hash, you hash the script with all the keys and that's what's in the output. This just shoves all the keys right in the output. So it makes outputs bigger. Um, makes the transactions bigger, makes them more expensive. And it's also recommended in this BIP proposal that you should opportunistically, um, if you have any payment um, channels, um, not in the lightning sense, in the sending a um, notification transaction so you can generate pay name addresses for people, um, they want you to use the change output with your money um just oh i'm making a regular transaction but i'd also like to make my change output this one of three multi-sig to open a payment code channel with somebody i wanted to um which is again going to exacerbate um your money management because just the change output in a normal transaction so a bunch of money is locked into a much bigger script that's much more expensive to spend and it's just like, yeah, um, I can understand without question um, 
the reasoning for wanting to support different derivation paths for multiple coins so that you don't have different chains correlating and leaking things. But, you know, in net, in a wallet where Paynim um, or BIP47 adoption was very large, on average, this, I think, would just start increasing the size of users' transactions and the fees they're going to have to pay. So it's like, I'm not really sure here. It's like, is that worth the optimization trade-off here? Or is that kind of just uh, alleviating one issue to make another worse? You know what I mean? Yeah, you let a little pressure off here, added pressure there. What's the best? I mean, yeah. Sounds like it's going to be something to help. <laughs> well, I mean, is it though? If you're using this for on-chain privacy in a system that's inevitably just going to start seeing more and more fee pressure, you're doing something to actually increase users' transaction sizes so they have to pay more in fees in a fee market. You know what I mean? Hmm. Yeah, that doesn't sound very helpful. Wish I had something to offer on this one. This is definitely a very technical topic. I happen to notice that it supports more address types than previous versions and has a different notification type than previous versions. So maybe they were going for some utility there. Uh, but if this isn't directly applicable to tap script, et cetera, or tap root as written, it sounds like you're going to have to readdress it. Well, no, it's like that's just not possible in design terms to use taproot for this kind of thing because like the, the whole point of this is this information has to be publicly recoverable by whoever has the key it's encrypted to just by scanning the blockchain so like this information can't be buried under taproot and used for this type of notification purpose because like that has to explicitly be in the output so someone scanning the chain will see it you know what I mean? Gotcha. Because it's like, you remember to recap, it's like the idea is you take somebody else's payment code and mush it together with your private keys and then encrypt that and use the notification transaction to get that to them so that when you start generating one-off addresses to send them money, like they know that like, hey, I'm sending you money. Don't forget to check if there's money in these. You know what I mean? And I so, think that's good. I'm just, it's so like taproot is like, that's the opposite direction you need to go to make this kind of on chain notification system work. That makes me happy too, in that we're going in a different direction. This can work on its own. We'll do some other things over here. <laughs> yeah, it is uh, interesting to see. Like, I mean, so if you want on chain privacy, I guess your fee is going to be a little higher. Uh, is that kind of where we're going with it? Yeah. I mean, it, it's definitely more flexible, um, like a lot better that you can bundle things if you want to do that opportunistically. But yeah, it's like ultimately using this instead of op return, the, the way I see it, this is just going to like that user regularly doing this is going to wind up paying more in fees, especially <laughs> if they just take change regularly outputs and do right. this, which would leave like a, a lot of your money if you're regularly paying people's pay names would wind up in these much larger outputs. So can you refresh me just a second? I'm thinking like, is BTC pay server like at the back end of this? This is all pay to script, script hash as well? Or is that they're using no, this? No, th this is the, the thing that um, Samurai implemented. Okay. Like the, the short nims where you can just get right. the one thing and then not reuse addresses. Okay. Well, yeah, it sounds like uh, definitely some, uh, you know, samurai. So always developing something. So I'm sure they're on some path. They got something they're working out. Mm -hmm. But going to be interesting to see how fast this progresses. Yeah, absolutely. So, Fud, you're up again, man. I heard some big brain dude rage quit. Oh. Yeah, this uh, falls under the heading of uh, meme stories of the past week, I suppose. Uh, yeah, so uh, some will know a gentleman uh, named Nicholas Nassim Taleb, who many years ago in a universe very far removed from where we are right now, wrote a book called The Black Swan. 
and started to talk about events, uh, risk events that happen maybe more often than people account for. And uh, went on to write a number of other books on interesting things to think about in the financial space. And uh, maybe modern day, maybe maybe we should refer to him as Fragile Nassim. Uh, I kind of like that moniker. So uh, people have been writing about his, uh, his various engagement styles now that he has rage quit Bitcoin. Uh, you know, he's, he's kind of had high esteem since uh, he wrote The Black Swan. Uh, he wrote that previous to the meltdown in 2008. Um, got a lot of credit for that. Got a lot of credit for thinking about what are called tail events, unlikely risk events uh, that you can bet on, but will re- rarely pay out to you. Um, his his argument was, you know, you may want to bet on these. Like GameStop may go to five hundred dollars. You don't know. So if if you think there's a chance it's going to happen, let's do it. So. I had never heard him actually admit to holding Bitcoin, uh, but Bitcoin seemed to be related to a lot of the subjects he talked about around risk, convexity, um, maybe um, revealed understanding of a situation where maybe you understand the process these early, but others do not. Um, so he came out and it, it sounds like he had a little bit of a, a snafu with another prominent Bitcoiner, uh, Safety, perhaps, uh, who's the author of a popular Bitcoin book called The Bitcoin Standard. Uh, in fact, uh, Taleb had written a two-page intro to The Bitcoin Standard at one point. Sorry, reading text. And uh, he uh, you know, displayed his understanding of Bitcoin in there. Uh, I read an interesting takedown lately from a guy named Let's see. Let's get his name right. Alan Farrington. Uh, so he's written on some Bitcoin topics. He's a ergodicity guy, which is uh, I'm not going to do ergodicity justice, uh, but somebody who's interested in the difference between perceived outcomes and how you would actually calculate that outcome or the variation. I'm not even going to get it. Sorry, yeah, we're, we're just going to skip that. So. It, he's been written about now lately, and uh, his understanding of Bitcoin has, you know, fallen into question. Uh, and, you know, it's kind of hard to expect popular writers to get all your, your Bitcoin technical terms right when they're talking. And oftentimes you'll, you'll sweep them under some metaphor like password or, or something like this, but it's not how the actual system works. Sorry, I'm getting yelled at again in text. Um, I'll, I'll try not to move around too much here. We, anyway, oh, I have to edit things. Yeah, yeah. I'm a first timer, you know. Like you're gonna get what you're gonna get. Some of it's gonna be gold, and some of it's just gonna be coal. You know what I mean? Burn it all. <laughs> okay. So uh, anyway, old Nassim, little bit out of favor this week. A little bit getting pooped on by the community when he rage quits because evidently Mr. Safedean disagrees with him about some COVID stuff. So it kind of felt like getting butthurt on disagreements in COVID land kind of got summed up really quick to uh, bailing out, rage quitting. Uh, And a lot of us wouldn't have thought Nassim maybe would do something like this. But, you know, this might just be a fixture and we'll see a lot of this this cycle uh, where Bitcoin gets cast. Uh, So if you're a software programmer and you've got some value sitting out there in RAM or something and you want to interact with it, typically you cast it to something. You say, you are this type of thing and that's how I can interact with you. And I kind of get the concept that, well, it's not just Nassim that's guilty of this, but people like to pick up Bitcoin and then they like to cast it to something and they like to say, oh, I read these people talking this way about Bitcoin and therefore Bitcoin is this. But Bitcoin, I mean, let's take this back to JavaScript, a little TypeScript. I know Shinobi loves that stuff. Bitcoin isn't any. Bitcoin can be whatever it wants to be. And sadly, how you cast Bitcoin doesn't do anything to Bitcoin. That's just how you're going to talk about Bitcoin. Bitcoin is a magical animal that lives in the internet that we don't completely understand yet. 
it's magic internet money, guys. Like, we didn't even know this stuff existed 10 years ago. We're pretty primitive over here, right? So Nassim has pulled this Bitcoin thing out because Stephen disagrees with him about something else entirely in the world, has evidently cast Bitcoin into this thing and uh, is now talking about it, which makes him, you know, he's succumbed to all sorts of fallacies that he would have bitched about in other people, but now he's taking completely uncorrelated interactions with the community and evidently making financial decisions on them, which I don't think he would tell anybody else to do. And, and honestly, you know, I, I think we've lived in a telling time for that. It's been interesting to me how many people that I've respected have been out there on Twitter telling everybody else how to take COVID data or their personal health or yada, yada, yada. And these people are finance experts. Most of them aren't doctors, right? And and they're all of a sudden very concerned about this or that. Um, so we live in interesting times. So anyway, Nassim, probably still holding some Bitcoin, if I had to bet. Dude, I was just shocked as hell at the rationale slash excuse he gave. Like, this isn't money because it's too volatile. I'm sorry, did I miss the... Did I miss the point where the whole Bitcoin community came to the consensus that um, we're done monetizing now? Like, this is it. Um, no shit, it's still volatile. It's barely even started up the fucking roller coaster of monetizing. You're right. It's not fair that I didn't present his argument. Evidently, Bitcoin still too volatile. And he came up with a graph to back that up. Uh, and I'm right there with you. Uh, since when are we done? Since when were we told ahead of time? When did Satoshi publish the volatility graph for Bitcoin? Like, it, did we know what was going to happen because of this? People are rabid hungry for Bitcoin right now. And if that means you're going to get upside volatility, oh my gosh, you know, I hope you can stomach that. It's very hard to hold on to Bitcoin during a bull market especially if you're a paper hands you see a number like 50 grand or you see a number like 100 grand and all of a sudden you're dreaming about teslas or something right and who knows what old nasim wants out of his life or whatever but i will personally happily sit through upside volatility i'll happily sit through downside volatility because we're on this path and you got to walk it to the end and take it yep yeah i saw that too too volatile it's like yeah are you kidding me? Volatile straight up? It's ridiculous. Like, uh, of course, there's like these periods. Every market has these bull and bear. But I mean, year over year, if you look at it, the volatility has been straight up. Yeah, I mean, come on, guys. Like <clears throat> a 10-year-old thing that's not even as big as, as gold now. Like, why is it still volatile? Like, this is broken, guys. Why is this still volatile? And what... <laughs> What's fun is usually people make the argue that make the argument that you don't want volatility so much you're willing to take an asset that is devaluing itself at well five percent a year called the U.S. dollar right a known loss versus what has been at least on our time scale solid upside volatility so buy the ticket take the red. Uh, yeah, I think you're right. I think it's like a, it's a big emotional thing. It's sad to see, especially like you're saying, we live in interesting times, but just like they take a, uh, an argument from something totally uncorrelated, unrelated, and they're going to just like cast it into this whole other side of their life and just be like, well, this is, I'm going to just say this and be done with it. But I don't know if I believe you, Nassim. I think I you're just either. saying he's crashed his boat with his treasure or something. That was my first reaction to, honestly. It's like, yep. There's a boating accident right there. Very public. Very nice. Well played. So, yeah. Nassim, stay sneaky. <laughs> Alrighty. Are we ready for a cool thing that does cool stuff? You must be talking about Bitcoin. So, Fudd, did you notice um, that CK Bunker is now um, part of the MyNode stack? So uh, plugging in that uh, that cold card and getting that that hardware security module set up that can do multi-sig, 2FA, like spending um, speed limits and things like that, even transaction maximum limits of sending, and people can make their own CASA. Like that's part of my node now. 
Like that's not like go wrestle with Python libraries and install it. And it, it's just, it's on my node. So just, this it's is just part of my node. I, uh, I did an upgrade to my personal, my node stack, uh, the other day and, uh, noticed a couple things. Uh, first of all, it let me see the log of what it was doing during the upgrade. You know, I've sat through many a MyNode upgrade wondering what is happening back there. And all of a sudden I have this log. Thank you. And uh, I can see it's compiling its Docker images back there. I kind of thought it downloaded them. Hmm, that's a neat feature too, isn't it? So once the whole stack recompiled and everything restarted, I did in fact notice I had a CK bunker icon. Now it's in beta, it's marked beta and a little bit worried about using beta stuff but as you say now on a, a very easy to set up stack you have an easy way to play with ck bunker which is great yep i mean at this point dude this is like out of beta this is perfect this is all your idiot friends who might get idiot scammed or dumb shit um can set up a multi-sig with you and your little hsm you can ignore and you can just set policies. Idiot friend cannot move more than this percent of his Bitcoin in one transaction without me overriding things. Idiot friend can't spend much more than this of his Bitcoin unless I override things. Like you can even put that to the point where you, somebody has to physically punch in a code on the running device to co-sign a transaction. Like, that is literally all your idiot friends. You can be CASA for them instead of running off and paying fees to throw them at CASA. Yeah, if it's not clear what CK Bunker is to people out there, it allows your cold card, your modern version V3 cold card, mm -hmm. to act as an HSM, which would be a hardware signing module. Uh, which means it can kind of be your trusted device. Uh, another way to think about it is you can turn your cold card into a bank for your buddies. And because it's a bank, like banks love rules. So you can set up all sorts of stipulations for different things that uh, you might be concerned about on sub accounts. And then you can fire up your own little bank in the cloud. Sounds awesome. Uh, I'll caveat, I have not played with it yet. I am super interested in it, and uh, we'll get back to you. Now, you guys are getting me hyped, man. I'm, like, looking up my node, and, I mean, I, I remember covering CK Bunker, and I know, like, all the pretty cool stuff about that, but, uh, like, I didn't really know about my node. I'm looking this up. Man, I'm getting excited. I need to sp I need to get a node stack going here. Yeah, I mean, like, think about this, dude. That's your, like helping your buddies safeguard cold storage like you could even take that or it could get rolled into bunker like give me time lock transactions so if i get hit by a bus idiot friends can get their money back after like six months or some shit you know what i mean yeah. and then like re really dude the thing that would take this to the next level is a mobile wallet where they can just have a mobile wallet like a hot wallet that uses the hsm and then it's like now you're not just um your buddy's casa um you're your buddy's Blockstream green too wow i'm so excited i got some mk3s because you know price going up you got to rethink your setup and everything but uh yeah now i'm starting to rethink all sorts of potential well, yeah, I mean, dude, it's like there are just a lot of valuable business niches in this space where some company effectively holds your hand um, so you don't get fucked because you're an idiot. This type of shit is like it doesn't have to be a company anymore. It's your buddy who knows what he's doing in this space and will personally hold your hand like you're, you're trusting a buddy versus a company to stop you from being stupid. That is such an unarguably better trust model for that kind of shit. Yeah. I mean, you get me really excited about the potential of just thinking about, you know, as somebody that ran a meetup, and I can't tell you how many times people came up to me like, hey, you know, where do I get some Bitcoin? How do I do this? And, you know, now that I'm starting to, I don't know, I moved, you know, I moved and I'm like in a place where, you know, I feel like I could do a little bit more. You know, it would be interesting to build like a, uh, you know, some town protocols to where like uh, somebody can, you know, 
feel like they're getting into Bitcoin and, and I can feel like I'm getting them into Bitcoin in the most appropriate way where, you know, nowadays it's so hard to tell people where to go. You know, I mean, like you could tell people a couple of places, but, you know, it's always like, you know, well, you got to stick with it. You got to see if they're going to keep doing the right thing. And <laughs> it'd be so much easier and like less of a heartache if I could just be like, well, you know, I mean, like I could sell you something and we can like, you know, set up a, a multi-sig and we can make sure that, you know, you're not going to get out until this point point or this year's or whatever and like you know i don't have to worry about them coming to me and be like hey it's time to sell it's like no we already set up that thing a long time ago yeah if you guys haven't checked this out while well, btc pay server maybe your on-demand e-commerce stack for bitcoin ck bunker is your banking stack i think there's a lot of potential here yep fucking awesome all righty this one is going to be weird this is going to be a weird story, guys. Yeah, I was trying to catch into it yesterday, and I was reading it, and I was like, man, this sounds um, sounds like something, uh, I don't know, I need Shino to explain to me. What's going on with uh, Brave and Tor? So who would have ever thought that Brave Browser would be covered on this show by somebody other than Janine? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right. Well, <laughs> um... Yeah, so um, sometime late last year, I think November, um, a user discovered that in Tor mode, um, Brave Browser was leaking all <clears throat> um, Onion um, name requests to an actual mainnet DNS server. Um, I'm not sure exactly low-level what was causing that but it's um something to do with the fact that they do some of their ad blocking stuff based off of c name records which do an isolated clear net um dns call and the onion addresses were leaking out that but so pretty much um since this bug got into brave um if you were not using a vpn or something else um to hide things from your ISP, then your ISP was seeing every Tor hidden service that you connected to with that browser. Um, and even using a VPN, um, that VPN provider is also going to see the exact same shit if you're using um, their DNS um, system or if they have something coupled there, um, that you're gonna be leaking that. So like, yeah. Um, <clears throat> Pretty much for months, um, Brave Browser has been snitching on every Tor user not behind a VPN to, to their ISP about everything they did on the darknet. And so just point blank, um, this is exactly why the Tor project has the Tor browser, which is maintained by the actual Tor developers so that everything can be taken into consideration in terms of tightly handling issues coupled with or Tor, keeping your browser fingerprint um, as homogenous as possible, which is something that Brave doesn't do with their Tor integration. And it's just like, yeah, imagine right now how many people who use this browser could have been doing dark net market shit and just oop their ISP, just why are they constantly going to this drug market on Tor, huh? Silk Road 4.0, where's this guy going? This one is uh, kind of straight fantastical to me, and it, it makes sense as a bug from a programmer perspective. So, like, let's say you want to go to blockdigest.com. The first thing you do is figure out where blockdigest.com is. We have to break through the English layer, whatever blockdigest.com means, and go actually find the computer on the internet that represents it. That's the very first thing you do before you do anything with Block Digest, whether load a web page or send a Bitcoin transaction or whatever you want to do. So apparently these guys in their code somewhere forgot that onion addresses are not something you look up via DNS and decided they would shoot them down the exact same channel as everything else and thus expose what you're looking for to the whole world. Well, Aka, your ISP, and every other network it flows through. So very conceivable problem, but one might think you would write a test case to detect this. 
Uh oh. They didn't. Evidently not. Man, anybody with Wireshark would notice this. And that's the thing. If this has been a bug since February, and anybody could notice this that was auditing browser behavior on your system, that's also a little weird. Dude, it's just, it, Sorry, it's, it's not as weird nope, as, as covering, um, yeah, but it's not as weird as covering anything to do with Brave Browser without Janine. Like, this is weird. Yeah. Let me just go ahead and say, what's what's his name? Brendan, what's Brendan his Ike. name? Yeah, Brendan Ike. He's an idiot. Oh, my God. Just for Janine, I'll say that. Yeah, he was on uh, Lex's podcast the other day. Definitely a smart dude. Definitely has been the right place a lot of the right time. Whether he needs cryptocurrency to run his little browser, I'm not. I'm not convinced. I hear people saying they like the browser, but I've never really taken use. I've never really used it. But uh, I mean, geez, this is pretty egregious as far as like somebody that's trying to build a privacy enhancing browser, and then you're leaking Onion addresses. I mean, the whole Onion network. I mean, if you're if somebody's using the Onion network, I mean, that should be the utmost. Like this is private. For sure, this is private. They're using onion, the onion network that they really want it to be private. Nope, it's just being leaked. Yep. But yeah. So FUD. I hear that fleeing to the countryside is a real popular move in this space these days. Who thinks yeah, it will so save them? I I've been watching uh Adam Carissa. Curtis's latest series here, and he's uh, talking about a guy named Michael X, who was uh, a British man who ended up running away after he murdered British citizens uh, due to his positions, uh, down into Africa somewhere, went up a river somewhere, they picked him up, they pulled him out, and they hung him. Interesting corollary to our news today, uh, evidently, and this was right around press time. Uh, Caitlin Long uh, tweeted to us that, in fact, the XRP Corporation, let's see what they're called. They are called Ripple Markets, W-Y-L-L-C, now has moved, in fact, to Wyoming. Um, because this is off the cuff, I'm going to trust her. She says they're moving from Delaware to Wyoming because of more crypto-friendly laws. Uh, enjoy, Wyoming. This will save us from the SEC, right? Right? <laughs> That's their move. We just move to Wyoming and be like, that. we're we're in SEC uh, no go zone, right? Yeah, I I had some witticism for this, but someone's deleted it from our notes. But uh, I I don't know if you can escape the SEC just by going to Wyoming. By the way, it's it's probably not as bad as being in New York, but I hear the SEC has jurisdiction there. Dude, there's got to be some um, some secession plan in motion that only See, here's select few know about. Other, other, otherwise, they're on a crack pipe binge or something. Well, they have the world's reserve of XRP, which unbeknownst to us and many others is the most valuable commodity that's ever been mined on Earth. So they're probably going to Wyoming to make sure that the bailment laws protect the most valuable thing humanity has ever discovered from the SEC. <laughs> Thank you, Wyoming, for making this possible. Oh, yeah. I guess right. uh, we're redrawing the lines, and uh, I guess XRP is going to find their way outside of the SEC's lines. If they can, we'll see. I uh, doubt it, though. All right, and the last story, literally take five seconds. NY Dig is filing for a Bitcoin ETF again. Boing! Done. I guess, I guess that's a cool thing now, again. I could refuse to cover another e Bitcoin ETF story. I just can't do it, man. Seeing things like MicroStrategy and all this sort of stuff, it's like, it's ridiculous. I mean, like, come on, there's Grayscale and there's fucking companies with lots of Bitcoin on their books. And I mean, I don't know. This Sorry, guys, we moved on. You didn't get the memo? Are, are there 20 of these waiting at the SEC? There's some giant stack. And I think Gabber Gerbax and Van Eck are honorably first in line, uh, at least conceptually. But they keep having to defile and refile because the SEC doesn't want to hear these things. So congrats on applying for yet one more ETF. I guess this one's notable. Um, I'm going to forget everyone's names involved. But uh, the company 
the guy who runs it, it's like Stony something, help me with the name. Anyway, he was on with Michael Saylor on Saylor's Exposing Bitcoin to Corporates. And his company had written a major annual report or like quarterly letter that was just glowing about Bitcoin all, all the way through it. So he has notoriety lately, the CEO does. Um, it's great that one more person, company, entity wants to offer you an ETF because we would all love one. But yeah, guess what? An ETF by itself doesn't the SEC make embody. Uh, instantiate. There we go. Instantiate. Everybody yeah. got bored with it. It's all about micro strategy now. <laughs> yeah, micro strategy is the first ETF, Bitcoin ETF. I think it's fair to say, though, uh, the GBTC price has noticed all these other players and has shrunk the premium down to a respectable, what, 8 percent ish? Good work, yep. boys. Yep, yep. Wow. So, yeah. I don't know, guys. I think it's I think it's part off. Final final thoughts time. Memeing contest is here. Oh no, the final thoughts. I actually had a good one. Um, you know, I've been on Mastodon uh lately, and um, let me pull this up. I uh, want to give a little shout out to who actually did this because they've been so active over there. Doctor Bitcoin MD, Doctor Bitcoin MD at Bitcoin Hackers on Mastodon. Yeah, he re uh, he grabbed something off of Twitter. So I mean, you know, somebody tweeted it, but he put it on Mastodon. So I'm gonna give him the credit. And uh, it's somebody in Boozman, Montana. It says Montana's housing crisis summed up on a downtown Boozman street corner today. Pics sent by a friend who says, "quote People are getting desperate." And it shows this guy looks like he's dressed up to go to a sporting event or something, and he's holding a sign that says "Sell to a local." Please sell me a home. And he's got his email address on the front. And then on the back, it's got a thing. It says, baby due in June, living in 400 square foot. Any leads help? God bless. Check on down payment. Check on financing. Check on solid income. No check on a home. Please help me find a home. And, yeah, guys, like we're entering some pretty rare inflation territory where the inflation is just so evident. And, uh, you know... I'm, you know, people are making moves on hard assets and the run's coming and we see where things are right now, but wait till the run really comes guys. I mean, it's going to come on a real hard digital scarce asset. And when it does, things are going to go crazy. I hope you're working on your setups too. Well, I just, I wanted to, to, uh, ask everybody to sign um, uh, my petition to, um, dig up all the soldiers buried at Arlington National Cemetery and move them because I just found out that that land used to be the estate of Robert E. Lee. And that is just unacceptable. That is just oh. unacceptable to have American soldiers buried on a former Confederate general's land. That's unacceptable. Get those bodies out of there. Wow. I didn't know that either, but I think that's kind of acceptable. <laughs> I'm from the South. I don't know. <laughs> I look just, forward just to A rumor I heard um, ascribed to um, an unnamed idiot from the house earlier today. So, yeah. I look forward to the U.S. being reseated to England. <laughs> All right. <laughs> yeah, so from my side, uh, certainly what you said, Rick, you know, we were listening to Michael Saylor talk about, you know, he, he's talked about how your reference rate is money degrading at 15 or 25 percent a year. And most people don't think about it that way. But I believe quarter on quarter, this previous quarter, housing prices across the U.S. were up something like 14 percent. I think that's a year on year number. But if that's how much housing can go up and the inventory is about half of what it usually is, I only assume due to COVID stuff, then your real inflation rate is about 15% or higher. And you got to start thinking about how are you going to insulate yourself from that? So yep. there's, there's a lot of things to think about up that alley. If you're thinking about Bitcoin, I think you're at a good starting point. There's a lot of different ways to take your research up that alley. 
as far as how to protect yourself from that world that's out there. And now is as good a time as ever to start down that path. If you haven't been down that path, if you haven't seen that fork in the woods yet that Elon is evidently seeing now, you know, you probably will pretty soon. And it's time to think about that long and hard because you can take either fork. It's up to you. And, you know, those around you will give you a lot of input as to which fork you want to take. But it's a hard decision to take the fork that most don't. So think about it. Do your own research. Sally forward. Don't forget to sign the petition. Later, everyone. Catch you later, punks. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs>